Hello and welcome to the March 30th episode of APHA's 15 on COVID-19 series. Today we'll be talking about ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in COVID-19. My name is Dan Zlot. I'm the Vice President of Education here at APHA. We're so glad you joined us. Let's go ahead and dive into today's topic. I have nothing to disclose. And the learning objectives for today. At the end of the presentation, you should be able to discuss the latest developments related to COVID-19. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's go ahead and dive in. So lately, we've all been hearing a lot about different controversies related to COVID-19, and today we've got another controversial subject, and that's the use of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in the setting of COVID-19. Um, not so much in patients who are infected, but in the general population where COVID-19 may be spreading. So um, a lot of healthcare professionals, and probably you um, as pharmacists, are getting questions from their patients about whether or not they should continue their ACE inhibitors or ARBs in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, there's some news reports out there um, suggesting or speculating um, or maybe commenting on the speculation in the scientific literature that ACE inhibitors and ARBs um, may increase the risk of severe complications or even the risk of death from COVID-19 disease. So uh, throughout, the t throughout today's presentation, we're going to take a look at some of that and see if there's any truth uh, to any of that information. So why the concern about ACE inhibitors and ARBs in the COVID-19 era. Well, let's see what let's review the information and see what there is to learn. Now, we know that early reports from China indicate that in addition to age, which was of course the number one risk factor for mortality, certain other risk factors also appear to place patients at higher risk for mortality in COVID-19 disease. And those risk factors include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. So as soon as those came out, uh, of course, the speculation started. Um, Observa the observations prompted a lot of people to start hypothesizing about potential causal relationships. Again, we're looking to find areas where we can intervene to decrease the risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. This is a natural response, but not always a helpful one when taken out of context. So let's help to separate fact from fiction uh, and hypothesis from rumor and try to put this all in context so that you know what to advise your patients when they ask you. So um, let's start off with some facts. The virus that causes COVID-19, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is covered in spike proteins that allow the virus to gain entry into target cells. Um, the photo here is a model created by the Rocky Mountain Labs from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease of the spike protein from COVID-19, from the COVID-19 virus. Um, these spike proteins we know bind to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2 um, that's present on cell surfaces. To further you know, explain whether or not this was necessary, um, some additional studies were done and they demonstrate that ACE2 expression is required for the COVID-19 virus to gain entry into cells. So it's pretty clear that this is the doorway through which uh, the COVID-19 virus is entering into cells. So um, now that we know how it's getting in, are there any other concerns? Well, it turns out that ACE2 is expressed on a variety of tissues, including the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, as well as the GI tract. So we know now kind of what tissues express ACE2. Additionally, there's some evidence that the administration of ACE inhibitors, as well as angiotensin receptor blockers, may result an increased ACE2 expression in animal models of cardiac disease. So if you followed that, maybe you're starting to get a picture of why some of the concern out there is, is rising. Um, if we know that this is how the virus gets in through ACE2, and we know that administration of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers increases the expression of ACE2, are we doing ourselves a disservice by continuing ACE inhibitors and ARBs in patients given the fact that COVID-19 is, is spreading out there. Um, so let's go ahead and let's attempt to answer the question. Let's see what we can discover. 
So before we dive into the hypotheses uh, related to whether or not ACE inhibitors and ARBs are to be avoided or maybe even beneficial in COVID-19 disease, let's take a moment to review um, the renin-angiotensin system. And we're going to look at this from maybe a different perspective than we learned about it in pharmacy school. We're going to talk about it in terms of these, uh, these pathways either being pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So this figure comes from um, a great article in Clinical Infectious Disease, uh, sort of reviewing a lot of this information and a lot of these hypotheses, as well as um, suggesting focus areas for research to help all of us answer this question as quickly as possible. It's a great article. I recommend it to you um, for your own reading if you have some time. So let's start off at the top here. So we all know we start off with angiotensinogen, and that is converted by renin into angiotensin 1. Um, from there, angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by angi angiotensin converting enzyme. And that, of course, is the target of ACE inhibitors. Angiotensin 2, uh, we think, is responsible for a lot of the uh, blood pressure effects that we're trying to mitigate. And as you can see, um, it may also be responsible for other pro-inflammatory effects. And that, we think, may explain why um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are so useful in conditions like heart failure uh, in patients who have had myocardial infarctions uh, and may help to mitigate, minimize, and on occasion maybe even help reverse um, some of the myocardial damage or myocardial remodeling, cardiac remodeling, um, that you see in some of those conditions. Uh, moving on to angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs, um, angiotensin 2 has the option to bind to either the angiotensin 1 receptor or the angiotensin 2 receptor. Um, angiotensin receptor blockers can bind to both angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 receptors. Um, however, they bind much more potently to the angiotensin 1 receptor than they do to the angiotensin 2 receptor. Um, the Potency is typically about a thousand times greater for angiotensin 1 than it is for angiotensin 2. So they're, they're relatively selective. So uh, essentially what that's doing is it's blocking the pro-inflammatory effect of angiotensin 2 and then shunting angiotensin 2, anything that happens to be around, into more of an anti-inflammatory pathway. So that's pretty much what we covered in pharmacy school. Let's take a little bit of a closer look now at the role of ACE2. So ACE2, or angiotensin converting enzyme 2, is a, a protein that you find on the cell surface of a number of different cells that we reviewed earlier, and it converts either angiotensin 1 or angiotensin 2 into the end product ultimately ends up being angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-7 uh, then binds to the MAS or MAS receptor, which is an anti-inflammatory pathway. So essentially what it's doing is it's sort of balancing out the pro-inflammatory aspects of the renin-angiotensin system, and um, we think it basically directly opposes the uh, activity of ACE1, or angiotensin-converting enzyme 1. So the two uh, sort of find a homeostasis to help regulate um, blood pressure as well as different pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory pathways. Now, again, keep in mind that ACE2 is also the target that the COVID-19 virus is binding to. So uh, again, just to reiterate, um, angiotensin 2 or angiotensin 1-7, if they bind to the right receptors, um, are anti-inflammatory. So why am I focusing so much on pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effects of these drugs? Well, um, if you happen to watch some of our previous 15 on COVID-19 series, in particular the one from March 24th where we provided an overview of COVID-19 disease, um, you may remember um, or you may recall that one of the interesting findings that we see in COVID-19 disease is that when patients run in, have severe complications of COVID-19, whether that's extreme morbidity or even mortality, one of the things that they see is immune-mediated organ damage. So it turns out that it's not actually the virus that causes a lot of these uh, organ effects. Um, it may be that it's our immune response to the virus that is causing so many of the issues that we're seeing in patients as they're going into acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, and then the full-blown um, pneumonia that results from um, the infection in general um, and sometimes even death. So. Um, there are a number of pathologic findings out there, autopsy reports that are that are reporting this. You can find um, highly activated immune cells in the lung tissue, occasionally in um, myocardial tissue. Um, so this pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory effect 
we think is a, a very important factor in some of the later stages, some of the more uh, severe symptoms of COVID-19 disease. So with that in mind, now let's go start looking at some of the hypotheses that are out there regarding the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in the setting of COVID-19. So now that we've got an understanding of that, as I said, um, the hypothesizing has already begun. Let's explore some of those hypotheses. So the first hypothesis is pretty straightforward. The idea that um, the upregulation of ACE2 expression by ACE inhibitors or ARBs may result in increased viral infection of cells. So again, that's the doorway that, they, that the virus is using to get in. So if we're opening the door or we're creating more doors for the virus to come in, it makes sense theoretically that maybe we're increasing the morbidity and mortality of the disease. So is there any clinical evidence to support the hypothesis? The answer is no, there's none. Uh, there's a lot of case reports out there. There's a lot of speculation and theory, but there's no hard clinical evidence where someone has said, I'm going to give someone a group of people an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and I'm going to give a different group of people not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give them an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and see if there's any difference in outcomes. That hasn't been done yet. So we really don't have an answer as to whether there's any benefit or harm um, to these drugs. So the second hypothesis that's out there is that it's actually more related to the activity of the virus. So we know that the virus binds to ACE2. So it may be that by binding to ACE2, the virus is actually inactivating ACE2. And remember, when we looked at that diagram, we said that ACE2 kind of helps to counterbalance the activity of ACE1. Um, and that's a pro-inflammatory pathway. So maybe by taking out the ACE2 um, protein, by binding to it, essentially the virus is pushing uh, the entire system into more of a pro-inflammatory state. Uh, and so that may be why we're seeing increased morbidity and mortality. Um, and it really has nothing to do with angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors. So that's a theory that's floating around out there. Um, is there any cl clinical evidence to support this hypothesis? No, not really. Um, there's a lot of uh, conjecture out there. Again, um, some lab results showing that maybe there's some changes in these things, but nothing that conclusively shows pro-inflammatory activity. Um, and so again, that's pretty much hypothesis at this point and still needs additional testing to uh, be able to make that determination. So let's take a look at another um, hypothesis. This one's sort of in the opposite light. Um, so we know that angiotensin receptor blockers prefer or preferentially bind to angiotensin 1 receptors, and we know that that's a pro-inflammatory pathway. So maybe by giving angiotensin receptor blockers, we're blocking that pro-inflammatory pathway. And in fact, maybe angiotensin receptor blockers provide a protective effect in COVID-19 disease. So there are people out there with this hypothesis as well. And again, mechanistically, this makes sense. Um, and so they're, they're actually advocating starting patients who have COVID-19 disease on angiotensin receptor blockers to minimize any inflammation that may result. So once again, let's look to the literature. Is there any clinical evidence to support that hypothesis? And just as before, there's, there's no evidence to support the beneficial role of ARBs in COVID-19 disease. It's pure hypothesis. Um, so another one in the hypothesis category. And the last hypothesis is that um, this has nothing to do with ACE inhibitors or ARBs whatsoever. It's just that patients with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension tend to have other risk factors, including typically being of older age, um, and they may have other health conditions. And so they just don't tolerate something as severe as the COVID-19 infection very well, and that predisposes them to worse outcomes in COVID-19 disease. And this whole ACE inhibitor, um, ACE2 pathway may just be a red herring. Um, so is there any evidence to support that? Again, other than, you know, descriptive evidence that's that's available out there through um, some of the data coming out of the, the Chinese government, the Chinese CDC, and that I'm sure as time goes on will be coming out of the Italian experience as well as the, the U.S. experience. There's really no solid clinical evidence to date to, re, to confirm or deny that either. So that's also in the hypothesis camp. So a lot of hypotheses. Um, so the other way to think of that is that really right now, we have more questions about the use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs in the setting of COVID-19 than we do answers. And that's not uncommon given how quickly this thing has uh, evolved. Almost any area of COVID-19, we've got more questions than we do answers.
So um, currently there's no clinical evidence to suggest either increased risk or benefit from ACE inhibitors or ARBs in COVID-19 patients. So the bottom line, when you get this question, should patients who are currently on ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers for you know, hypertension or heart failure or diabetes, should they be transitioned to other agents until the COVID-19 event is behind us? Well, let's take a look at what some of the leading uh, cardiac organizations out there have to say. So these are the current recommendations from the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the American Heart Failure Society. They all got together and released a joint statement. And here's what they said. Uh, at this time, Patients who are currently taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs for indications for which there's known benefit should continue taking the medications. In other words, don't stop ACE inhibitors or ARBs just because uh, of the COVID-19 scare. Um, that would be premature. We don't have any data one way or the other. And in, as I said, one of the theories even says this may be beneficial to keep them on um, ARBs in particular. So um, that's all theory. We need further testing to be able to answer the question. Um, if an individual who takes ACE inhibitors or ARBs is diagnosed with COVID-19, we should do what we always do, which is use our best judgment. So we need to look at that individual patient and make decisions based on the, the patient's hemodynamic status and clinical presentation to determine if we need to make any modifications to therapy. Keep in mind that the vast majority of patients out there, more than 80%, have no or mild symptoms. So in a setting like that, what, should we discontinue ACE inhibitors or ARBs? We don't know yet. Um, in severe disease, should we discontinue ACE inhibitors or ARBs? Certainly if the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable, um, we probably don't want blood pressure medications on board, um, but maybe we do. That's that's something we need to look into. Um, if the, the theory that angiotensin receptor blockers may actually provide benefit, maybe we want angiotensin receptor blockers on board. So again, the bottom line, and another thing that these organizations stressed, is that more research is urgently needed and we need it as quickly as possible. So that will wrap up today's episode. We're so glad you were able to join us. Um, tomorrow's, or not, sorry, not tomorrow, um, April 2nd, um, we will have another episode uh, coming out, which will be looking at remdesivir in COVID-19. And as before, we want to know if you have questions about COVID-19 disease. What questions are, are you coming up with? What questions are your colleagues asking you? Um, email those to us. Let us know. We'd love to um, get your thoughts on what you'd like to see in future episodes of the 15 on COVID-19 series. Um, please email any suggestions to covided at aphanet.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see you on April 2nd.